haven't heard of Damian Wilcox, you should have. He's been doing the underground comics thing for almost 20 years. Damian has seen the ebbs and flows of a creative community as he's toiled away mostly on his popular character, Dork Boy. He hasn't stopped there, however, as he's branched out to characters like Scooter Boy, Colonel Corn, Scully, and one-shots like Workin' Jones, I'm Actually Much Scarier in Person, and the most recent, The Early Worm Gets the Bird. He's also experienced the toils of working his projects into TV, and has written a musical with legend Shannon Wheeler titled Too Much Coffee Man Opera. Here we go, Damien! So we're here with Damien Wilcox. So Damien's been a long time face in the underground comic scene in Alberta. Um, when I think of underground comics people in Alberta, it really is him that I think about. And I think a lot of people think about. Some people have even said that they've gotten into doing comics because they've read your stuff and they're right. inspired by you. That's nice to hear. <laughs> no pressure. Glad though. something good came out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. So Damien's done a lot of stuff over the years. Um, what year did you start doing it? Oh. Um, I think officially, uh, 1997, um, 1995, I did the first Dork Boy okay. comic, which was, so I was in college, a friend of mine were, had a page to fill in, in the back of his, um, back of Little Bean's, uh, projector, of course, and he had 10 minutes left, uh, left before the, uh, deadline, and I saw him in the hallway, and I was like, let me draw something. Awesome. <laughs> so I, I drew this really quick thing called a Dork Boy, there's a guy in this flying potato, there's a uh, Nazi warplane, heat-seeking turtles, all within you know, a couple panels. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then uh, a few weeks, uh, a few years later, I made the first, I guess the first issue. <laughs> it, it was meant to be a, a Christmas card to friends, um, so I drew it up as like a four or five page comic, um, printed a bunch, gave out a bunch to friends and family. Surprisingly, people liked it. Cool. Surprisingly, I, I had fun doing it um, because before that, I didn't really want to draw comics, mostly out of laziness. <laughs> because I like drawing one thing um, and having to draw the, the repetition, like animation, I never wanted to do because how many drawings for one second? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. Uh, and, and comics was better. I mean, you didn't have to do like 24 uh, drawings for a second or anything like that. But, but still, I mean, it was so much redrawing and that sort of thing. Um, so it sounds like maybe a kind of a natural evolution for you into doing something a bit more. Yeah, it, it was accidental completely. Okay. I, I, you know, it was strictly a Christmas card. I had fun doing it. People really seemed to like it around work and stuff. Um, so I went and started working on a second one, um, and not knowing anything about <laughs> anything, <laughs> uh, I, I thought, okay, I'll just see if some stores will sell them. Right. <laughs> Magazine stores. If sell this, like photocopied, crappily drawn, you know, home stapled okay. <laughs> thing. Um, and I, I didn't know any better. I, I mean, I just started taking to stores because I saw people, there was like a few other zines and things like that. And um, I thought, well, I'll take all those and we'll put this on the shelf. Um, and I just kept going from there. So what were some of those stores? Uh, that you can think of. I mean, that's well, like the, 20 years ago probably, but. It's getting close. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, um, well, I, I took it to a few comic stores. Uh, I had some learning experiences there from some of the rather direct management when I went to check on sales at one of the shops. <laughs> um, they, they put me a, a loony and sent me on my way and made me feel a little bit big. So I'm oh, yeah. Surprised I didn't quit right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, the, the magazine store um, was it with the Times, I think it is, in Kensington. And then later they had a store on 4th Street. Um, they, they were pretty good. They were like supportive, surprisingly. Um, and then I started take, reaching out to some of the comic shops. Uh, I don't, that first one, I, I don't think I had it in too many stores. Um, and even a lot of the subsequent ones, I, I started making little stands and seeing if coffee shops would. <laughs> put them there and put an envelope on the back so if people did want to pay for it they could drop them oh, yeah. there and um, you know if they didn't you know they didn't uh, some people would like draw on them and I'd go to see how things were doing and be like wow <laughs> <laughs> color them in okay um, so yeah there's there's um there's a few stores that the thing was over the years it got to the point where I was like having to run around to a lot of stores and that was taking a lot more time I mean this is you know 
not a full time thing, it it was something you're doing after work and with some friends and that sorta thing, so having to run around stores and check inventory and do all that stuff and try and keep on top of that, um, it was just you know, bigger and bigger job. Mm, okay. Uh, so Dwarf Boy was kind of the, the first thing yeah. that you got, that you yeah. grabbed onto, and you went with that for quite a while? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> quite a few years. Um, so the, the, the comic I, I did in college was called Dwarf Boy, um, yeah. the, the little one-pager. Uh, I did some comics like back in grade eight, uh, as like a one-time thing, sure. and that was Robo Bill. Robo Bill. <laughs> that, that was a that was a mashup of Robocop and Mr. Bill from Saturday Night Live. Okay. They had like the big Mr. Bill lips and but we, we ended up moving and I, I think I threw them out because I was not happy about moving. We ended up moving to Red Deer for my different hat. Um, but the the Dark White one was just kind of a natural name that came about for the first one. Just seemed like a natural progression to keep going with that. Um, and yeah, I just kind of kept doing it. It was fun. Uh, working with the comedy, that sort of thing. And at one point, I was getting an itch to do something different, mm. um, something a little more realistic. Uh, and I was struggling with this, you know, I've been doing Dark Boy so many years, and it seems like people like it, and what if I change now? And then I was like, wait, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> why not? Like, if I want to do something different, why not? Why should I limit myself to, to one comic? Um, and obviously now, there's like <laughs> so many different titles going on, but... Um, so I, I put together this work in Jones comic, which is a little more slice of life, um, yeah. a little more realistic. And, and That's my favorite one, probably. It, it yeah. seems like it had a lot of good feedback in yeah. general. I, I'd like to do another one. They're, they're hard to do um, in terms of the creation process. Uh, it, it's, I, I feel like it's, it's, I guess, a little more natural, a little more easy to put together something that's but um, working Jones, it just uh, a lot of subtle considerations hmm. because it's more realistic, uh, a lot of nuances, um, expressions, gestures, and dialogue. You know, there's so many considerations that can alter the tone of, of a story like that, hmm. um, which you it, that plays into com you know more of the funny stories as well. But um, it, just being a lot more serious is. I guess maybe maybe it's due to me not being as familiar with doing that right as compared to the more humoristic sort of thing. Yeah, that's it's kind of surprising because I think a lot of people would say that they they probably have a harder time with comedy because comedy requires such a good understanding of the culture that you're in and understanding what makes people laugh, right? I mean, your stuff's always kind of had that comedic element to it, like the most recent stuff definitely does. But um, where am I going with that? <laughs> You asked me about my comedic influences growing up. <laughs> I could ask you about that. <laughs> Sounds like Saturday Night Live is one of them. <laughs> um, like when when I was when I was growing up, I, I was watching. I was like recording stuff from the '60s, like Get Smart and um, Rowan and Atkinson's Laugh In, and like watching all these old Evening at the Improvs um, rerun stuff like that. SCTV. So I was always kind of watching a lot of comedy. Okay. Even from like a young age. But you're um. Your style has always been very autobiographical. Like even the even the dork boy stuff that you say is comedic and maybe not as raw or real. Like when I'm reading that, I'm thinking, okay, well this is probably based a lot on on being in play, right? <laughs> and then uh, even reading Scooter Boy, and I thought, wow, this this dork rides around the scooter an awful lot. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <familiar. laughs> so so what about that? Like why autobiographical comics? Like what brought you that way? Um. I think it's just a matter of, like, wh whether it's writing or drawing, um, you kind of need to be genuine. Um, so if I think people can tell if, if you're truly making something up, and it doesn't. Um, what do I want to say? <laughs> um, it doesn't carry the weight of something that that is more sincere. Um, so yeah, I mean. I've got Colonel Corn and Peter. I've got these vegetables traveling through the digestive system, <laughs> yeah. and, and obviously there, there's you know, some element of fiction there. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I think with anything you do, you, you, you have to inject um, some sort of whether it's personal experience or, or personal element to it. 
um, how much of it you do, I think, can vary by the story, because obviously you, know, you can't do a story about aliens and have it be 100% biographical. <laughs> right. Um, but I think with anything you do, you really need to inject a lot of, a lot of yourself to, to make it authentic, and, and I think that's what gets people to respond to it. I mean, it's, there's so much stuff out there that you know, just doesn't have a heart or soul to it, and, and there's the authenticity uh, authenticity <laughs> isn't there. Um, and, and I think people can tell. You know, it's easy to tell something that's been, been pumped out because people are trying to um, make a buck or make money on a franchise or something like that. Um, but I think anything you kind of do with more of a personal effort is, uh, is a bit helpful. Right. So just thinking of, of some of your... Uh, Body of work, your whole body of work, uh, is working Jones probably the closest to you as the real person? Like, are you letting the audience in on a bit more of you than, say, with Dork Boy and Scooter Boy and Colonel Corn and Peter? <laughs> I, I think in in some in some respects, yeah. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the comics I've been doing lately, um, which I've I, I struggled with the title for them, and I've basically reappropriated the Dork Boy title for these now. Um, because the original Dork Boy has been done right. <laughs> for so many years. Right. Um, and the character you know, looks very similar. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it doesn't have the crazy big eyes, which I originally did as kind of a, kind of a, a slight knock against anime, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny, and then I, I think people thought I was like a serious freak. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, Work in Jones it definitely has some personal aspects to it. The... Um, I mean, even even Colonel Corn and Peter, oddly enough, does as well. I was having a bunch of like stomach health issues for a while there. Okay. <laughs> and there was actually a lot of a uh, tie in to that as well. Not not obvious by me, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I can go read that again and just be like, yeah. or Dave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but but even uh, even some of the kind of more autobi- uh, recent autobiographical type ones where I've got my character, my wife, the dogs, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's somewhat therapeutic to include real life events in there. Like I've had ones where I've just included deaths of relatives, um, health issues, and various other things. But I think that's how I mean different people deal with things differently. And I think dealing with things with humor is not only beneficial for you know the, the person going through it or dealing with it, but also other people. Um, that have access to it. Mm. I did um, I did one comic years ago, and <laughs> there's been a few times where I've done a comic, and I'm like, should I let people see this? <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one of those was involving the Pope and vultures. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I did that one, and I, I just I was afraid to post it. Um, in retrospect, it's you know not bad. But uh, another one I did was um, the, this guy goes to the doctor and he says. He was bitten by a... Uh, oh, so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, Oh, you've been bitten by a radioactive spider. And he's like, uh, I, I'm a superhero. He's like, no, oh, you've got cancer. Oh. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, it's just like, <laughs> wow. drops the whole feeling of the comic, and then he's like, is it super cancer? <laughs> Which, <laughs> and I was really hesitant to send that out. And, and at the time, um, I had this kind of email list at, at where I was working. Um, and, and I sent it out, and I thought, well, hopefully... <laughs> and and one guy replied to me and and he said uh, he was going to forward it to his brother that, that was going through cancer at the moment and he he was like appreciated it so so things like that are nice to hear back <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds like it um, but it sounds it sounds like you've done a lot of things over the years to try to promote your stuff and and find readers so what would you say is the strangest thing that you've ever done to to get your comic out there. I think us as underground comic producers, we really do have to do it. Of course not. I think I think in recent years I've, I've gotten more lazy, um, and I've just relied on you know, posted to the website, posted to every social network, and um, I used to do a lot more footwork. Uh, you know, hang up, like print out eleven by seventeen posters, go to Stephen Avenue and staple gun. <laughs> right. And e- even you know they'll be covered up by a more interesting poster a band coming soon or something like that within 20 minutes or something like that <laughs> uh, I do things like that put up stickers uh, basically just giving out comics a lot randomly yeah um, 
the and then I don't know the, the place I was working the, the one year I, I made a bunch of dog boy socks <laughs> came, oh yeah <laughs> came out to a bunch of people for Christmas and like just bought socks and put a little like glow in the dark circle piece yeah on, on the sock <laughs> um, but it was just it, it's weird because looking back it wasn't I wasn't consciously thinking I need to promote this I need to get this out there I need to turn this into a brand and a money making business it was never like that it, it was like this would be fun. I'd love to do that, and, and I would do it. I, I learned how to silk screen shirts myself, um, just because mm. I wanted to make shirts. It wasn't because I was, you know, thinking how can I, you know, strengthen my brand or <laughs> right. make a quick buck or whatever. Um, I, it was just stuff I wanted to do and I was interested in, and it was good because I learned some things along the way. I learned screen printing, um, but the, yeah, I, I mean, the socks are probably a little. <laughs> so, so you never had this intention to create a brand. No. But there was a point, I guess, where you had been optioned, or there was talks of a TV show for Dork Boy. Yeah, there, the the TV show one was interesting. Um, I, it was good. It was actually that was a it was an interesting experience, and I'm glad it happened because <laughs> um, it it made me realize where I wanted to go as a comic and where I didn't want to go. Oh yeah. Um, so there there was a guy. I actually had a couple people uh, approach me in San Diego, um, both from various TV viewing uh, production companies. Um, and I went with the one guy because I recognized he meant to make a bunch of the Stuart Little. And I'm like, okay, I've heard of Stuart Little. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. The mouse? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, you know, this was, when was that? That was 2005. Okay. Um, and I just printed my first of the, the blue, uh, that, that one. Okay. <laughs> um, the, my first actual comic that is... Sounds of mirth and despair. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so I had that one done at the show, and um, there, there's this guy who was sitting talking to me, and he was his card and that sort of thing, and they, we got in touch later on, um, and he, he was interested in, in taking it more to studio-type audience. Okay. I was wondering if I, I envisioned it as a television show or a movie or you know, live action, animation, that sort of thing. Um, and, and I was thinking, well, you know, maybe a TV show, definitely not live action. I don't think Dork Boy lends itself to live action. Right. <laughs> um, I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't picture that at all. Um, and I, and I was thinking more of like traditional animation, not TV. It just didn't seem like a good fit. Sure. Um, so. I kept having these back and forth calls, and meanwhile I'm, I'm working at this company and I get phone calls in the daytime and I'd <laughs> be like, you know, chatting about this potential TV show. Um, and as it went along, the, the, I guess, the more it progressed, uh, the less interest I had in it. Mm. Um, so as things went along, he's like, okay, we, you know, we, we've got a writer attached to it and we're going to pitch it to the networks. Um, and I was like, but I... Like, I was like, right. you know, there's a lot of things going on in your mind, and it's, I, 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 I mean, there's always the, the question of, um, when you're doing comics or any sort of creative endeavor, where do you want to go with it? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, at that point, I was kind of winding down on Dork Boy, mm. and I was work, I was, you know, Scully was starting, um, literally just starting, uh, Colonel Corn, um, all of those ideas were just starting to develop into characters and at that point I didn't uh, I didn't feel um, I didn't feel like Dork Boy was going to continue a lot which is um, if, if I'm not you know stealing the, uh, the, the title I don't you know, right. force it <laughs> right um, so so they were pursuing you know the, the, the one kind of character and, and story that I, w I was having less interest in but at the same time I, I didn't want to I didn't have any interest in, in trying to cash in on it either. Right. Um, it, you know, if if it went out there and it was written by someone else and, and the, you know, the name was Dork Boy and I was like somewhere in the credits and they gave me a bunch of money, I, I, I don't know that, it's like everyone always says, yeah, but you'd be rich or whatever. And yeah. It's like, and theoretically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a bunch of TV things that never pan out anyway, but even, even if you did get some sort of payment out of it, um, I would feel like it was just this completely separate entity for me. Right. I'd be like, well, you know, they basically bought 
how they referred to it, the property, which is like you know the name of the character in mm-hmm. the premise maybe. Um, but is there really anything else about it that's mine? Um, right. So, um, so yeah, so so they pitched it to the networks. Um, the response came back that there there wasn't enough adult characters. They wanted something more like Family Guy. I don't like Family Guy at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, well, it's just it's just a lot of gags. It's not a cohesive storyline. It doesn't have. It just feels patched together. Like this is going off topic. <laughs> More of a Simpsons fan. Than okay. okay. Anyway. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard that, and, and at this point, like it had been going on a few months, and I, I was just less enthused and less um, uh, interested in, in having it go anywhere. And when he said that, he he kind of said he he just. It seemed like an open question, mm. and he, he didn't say it was done. He didn't. He just said they, they want more adult characters, and, and it felt like an open invitation to, you know, where one response might be, oh, let me work on it, let me, you know, infuse some adult characters and do some other things, and, and blah, 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 um, which could have been one route, could have gone probably, um, but I just said, oh, okay, uh, thanks, and then right. hung up, and that was the end of it. Right. <laughs> Because I just I didn't want to pursue it, um, and at that point, I just didn't feel like something that was really mine anyway. Okay. So, um, anyway, <laughs> it was an odd experience, but um, I'm I'm glad it happened. It was it was interesting to see how how it played out. Yes, yeah, so you're you're kind of talking about like, uh, and I was going to ask you about this. To what end is are you doing all of this, right? So for a lot of guys, <laughs> I think a lot of people have that question. Yeah. So for a lot of guys doing uh, underground independent comics, it's like, okay, well, I would dream of that to have somebody come along and say, hey, we want to take your stuff and do something with it, and yeah, potentially you could make some more money off of it. But the sense I've always gotten from you is that that may not necessarily be the goal. Like there is no sort of, okay, I'm gonna achieve this level. I'm gonna. Yeah, but it's. I mean, when, when I first did it, the like e- even when the um, even before that, when when the publishing thing came up, um, literally it, it had never crossed my mind. Mm. I, I used to send my books to uh, <laughs> mostly out of a joke because I wanted to see what kind of stationery they used on their rejection letters. <laughs> but I, I I used to send it to Marvel and DC, and I'm like, there's no way they're ever going to use it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in with any of their stories. I know I'm like. But I was just like, well, let's see what they send back. And actually, I think it was, um, was it DC? Superman's DC, right? Yeah. Okay. So it was, <laughs> the, DC had a really nice letterhead, the rejection letter. Because on the back, they had, um, they had like a totem pole of yeah. the superheroes in color. And then on the front, you could kind of see their. Oh, yeah, that's neat. So that was pretty good. Um, I did send it to a few of the smaller uh, places like Slave Labor Graphics and, and Top Shelf. Um, and when I was in San Diego, I talked to the Top Shelf guy a little bit. And, Gave my books and, and they were always good. I mean, they'd um, give feedback, uh, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, the publishing never really crossed my mind. Like even now, I I haven't submitted anything um, for years for any company. Mm. But I've just because at the point I'm at now, I mean, it, it, there's enough services out there. I can print color books myself um, finally, which is nice. Yeah. Um, they go up on Amazon. I can get them for shows. People can order them online. It's, right. I don't know how much more having a publisher helps. <laughs> right, right. Um, in, in theory, they, they do a lot of uh, advertising and that sort of thing. Um, but I've heard mixed reviews on that, both right. from the book and comic publishers. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you, too, about, about that evolution of um, sort of the formatting. So you've gone from very mini <laughs> comic kind of style. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with the, the, uh, one or two staples in it to full glossy, full color all the way through. It's, it's always been a matter of, of um, being sustainable. Um, like when I started, um, and, and I, this is something I want to do. I, I, I want, actually want to do a comic of the whole process as it is coming up on the 20 year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> wasting my life. Sorry um, to bring it up. No, but I, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I, I had thought about trying to get it done this year, but I feel like the story is a little more complex because I'd like to include not only what's gone in kind of in terms of production of the comics, but also put in what's been going on in my life kind of behind the scenes and sure. how, you know, that's what gets me into the comics. So it feels like a big project, a pretty big project. It's something I'd like to do and I just don't want to rush out. Um, but that was totally sidetracked. But, 
getting back to your question, yeah, <laughs> of um, the the comic formats, it, it's always been a, a matter of, of what's sustainable. Um, it, it's you know, it, it, there's not kind of this bank of dork boy that. <laughs> Uh, well, I guess in a sense, I mean, if there's sales and stuff, it will go into the jar and come out of the jar. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, but I've always tried to have a balance of, you know, if I can afford to do something better, I'll do it better. Um, and if, if I can't, I can't. When I first started, I um, had a lot of help uh, <laughs> in photocopying some of the books. Um, and I'll, I'll put that in the larger story that I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so there was some of that. And, and then as it, as it, grew more and more, um, then it gets into you know, how, you know, how many do I think I'll sell, uh, like with Dark Boy number f- f- six, uh, 6, 6.1, um, I did an offset cover because it was something I wanted to do, <laughs> and offset printing is a lot more expensive, you have to do a lot more copies, so I ended up printing like I think a thousand or something of those, um, and I just did it for the cover, and I thought, well actually no, I think it's the internals, I think I did offset too, but usually going photocopying was cheaper at that point. Um, but that one I wanted to do color, and I did a two color offset. Right. Same thing for the next one. I did a one in as well. <laughs> right. Um, but it, it's, it's always a matter of, of what's uh, what's affordable. Um, at, that, at that time, the print on demand, the quality wasn't there color wise. The price was really high. Um, and I just did everything black and white. So around 2005, like, well, once I did this book, um, and, and that one, again, it was you know, three hundred eighty four times the print on that sort of thing. So after this book, um, that was two thousand five, um, and after kind of the whole network TV experience, I started reevaluating things. Um, like like I, I was, I was printing other things that I would just give out for free. Like I was printing full color calendars um, that I would give out to. Well, I'd, I'd sell some around work, and then I'd, I'd give some to like shops that were carrying the comics and that sort of thing, mm-hmm. and then uh, friends and family. Um, and then uh, I remember one shop got angry at me because it got bent. I mailed it to them, and it got bent. And oh. <laughs> uh, and that, that was like there was that there there was the network TV stuff, and I was like I'm spending all this time doing all this business stuff that's really making me hate comics. And at that point, I was like, I don't need to do that, and I just I stopped. Um, I stopped conventions. I stopped running the stores, uh, and I started doing everything online. I decided mm. to just purely be a web comic from that point. Um, uh, and then that's you know I was focusing on Scully, Infernal Corn, mm. uh, and I just kept doing that for quite a few years. Um, and then at some point I decided to go to the Calgary show. I thought you know I'd probably be good to <laughs> go to a comic show, and um, and I had like several years worth of work. So I went to the one show and, and then um, investigated some print-on-demand solutions so I, I could look at maybe doing a color book and, and then I started doing the, the new book in, in color mm. um, in, in a new format um, because I had this whole backlog of work <laughs> from, from the several years there and then constantly doing new stuff. Um, and then that kind of brings us up to today where the last few years I've just been basically putting out a book or, or two <laughs> um, every year uh, for the last few okay. years. Um, so before we got going with the interview, you talked about being at the conventions and sort of witnessing this whole progression of the underground comic scene in Calgary and Alberta, and you just kind of being on the periphery of that, yeah. kind of witnessing all <laughs> yeah. that. So why is that? Why is that? Do you think that happens? Um, like why, why was I not more involved or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you prefer to just be on the periphery and just kind of did it go along with what you're saying about you know when when you got um, this, this company wanted to make your comic into a TV show it's like well the the end goal isn't that I don't really have that sort of destination I'm just really enjoying this for myself yeah I mean I I, I don't know I I guess I saw a lot of stuff going on and, and I was going to the comic show but it, it was just not. Um, I mean, I, I didn't, I owned a Superman t-shirt before I started comics, <laughs> had a Batman mug, enjoyed some of the TV shows. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't routinely read comics. I don't know a lot about comics. Um, so, you know, when, when I started, it was just me, mm. like just doing my own thing. 
and, and I don't mean that in a broad sense. I mean, there, there was other people um, doing their own thing. Uh, like Scott Dutton was doing some stuff. There was, um, I forget his name, Lee. Uh, uh, he, he's a professor at Mount Vernon now, I think. Is it Richard Harrison? Richard Harrison! <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Nick let me, Johnson. Let, exactly. <laughs> let me let me pick a completely wrong name. And then, <laughs> I don't know where Lee came from. Wasn't there a Lee someone? Uh, I can't remember. Didn't, wasn't there like a duo? But uh, I, I saw these other books and I was like, oh, like superhero. And I'm like, oh, there's other people doing their own comics. And I'm like, wow, they're better drawn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was just, I was like, I didn't know who those people were. I, I just had no idea. And I, I just put my stuff out. And yeah. I just... You know, I was kind of going along doing my own thing, you know, skateboarding, drawing comics, playing bass, working at an engineering company, like just right. this weird concoction of things. Um, and I just didn't really have, uh, I just didn't have a really good connection, I think, with, with the comic, comic community, mm. hopefully. Um, like, I, I talked to people as I dropped stuff off and, and got to know people at just different shops and that sort of thing. Um, when you were doing Dork Boy, were you, and, and, uh, Workin Jones, did you know that there were other people doing autobiographical comics? Um, like, in, in anywhere? Or yeah, like, anywhere. Uh, the, I think Workin Jones probably, um, got sparked a bit because I was reading, uh, Adrian Tomine's Optic Nerve. Okay, yeah. Um, and I really like those, and I, but I, I didn't want to do something just like that because it was, it feels feels like that was maybe over here, and what I would want to do is kind of off in this direction. Um, but that's that's a good <laughs> short way to paraphrase. <laughs> um, so th I was I was aware of his work. Um, I wanted to ask you too about the too much coffee man. Oh, the <laughs> the musical. Yeah. How did that project come about? Well, it was it was many many years in the making. So one of the uh, so I, I started reading some of his comics. Um, Shannon Shannon Wheeler, right? Yeah, and okay. he started, I think, much the way like myself and a lot of other people did, just photocopying, taking his stuff to stores. And he had a lot of comics about that very topic. Right. <laughs> you know, folding, stapling, making mini comics, and taking them everywhere. Um, uh, so. I was reading some of those, and I ended up getting in contact with them, and, and then over the years we kind of just kept in touch. Um, he started doing a magazine for a while, Too Much Coffee Man magazine, um, so I did a couple of things for that, and I had a comic run, uh, did an illustration in another, um, had a few ads for like Work and Jones and some mm. books in there. Um, and then at, at work I was doing these odes. <laughs> Like I would do an ode to coffee or an ode to whatever, um, and I'd send them around. And I think I had him included on my on my distribution email okay. list. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he liked the coffee one. He ended up using that one on on the coffee mugs that he made. Oh yeah. So I had this ode to coffee. Um, then he sent it on the back, and then he had an image on the front. Uh, and then he started um, going down the road of doing opera. Because <laughs> that's the natural next nice, coffee well, yeah, the, cups. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there were there were no comic operas out there, so um, <laughs> so he he headed down that road, um, and I thought it sounded fun, and he wanted me to be involved because he he liked the odes and uh, the wacky ones that I had in there. So I, I do a lot of emailing, like come up with some portions, email it to him, he'd email back, and that went on for several years. Um, and then I met up with him at a comic convention. In uh, Vancouver, and I think I think we were still in the middle of going back and forth on that. Um, and then shortly after, eventually <laughs> completed uh, the the opera, and that that was a period of I think it was about four or five years. Wow! Of back and forth, um, and I was really happy with with what came out of it. Um, and um, you know, he he had a friend that worked at a libretto. Um, he set up all the actors and you know made, made right. a production of it and we went down to Portland and saw it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, that got presented a few other times. Um, a bit later on uh, he started, a, he wanted to do a second one um, and I, I had just changed jobs and I was slumped and I, I couldn't, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> around time. And then um, it was around Christmas and, and Pete was going to the beach at the my grave site. So it was like mm. a period of four months and I'm like, the first one took five years. It's like how wow. <laughs> uh, so I ended up just not really being involved in, in the second one at all. I remember it was uh showing in San Diego in two thousand and six oh, yeah. or seven when we were there. Yeah. Totally awesome. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah. And a lot of people turned out to see it. Like there was oh, a lot of awesome. people <laughs> interested in being a comic book author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun. It was uh it, it was weird because I went to the show and, and um, when, when we saw it, it was like hearing people speak your lines was, was really odd. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was cool. interesting project to do. Cool. <laughs> okay. Um, what, what's next? What are you doing next? What are you working on? Uh, <laughs> well, I want to do that 20-year that story. Um, that, one, that one's kind of in the back of my mind. I really need to kind of sit down and flesh that out. That's going to be a big project to do. Um, the probably in the last couple of years, I've started veering more towards the uh, more autobiographical comics with the watercolored ones that I'm doing lately, um, and then just some of the one-offs that are just from the comic cartoons. Uh, I'm really enjoying doing those right now, um, and that's something that I've actually been doing with change. <laughs> Like, oh, people are reading stuff. I'm going to change. Yeah. <laughs> Lose all my readers, start something else. <laughs> um, but uh, for right now, I mean, that it's, that's mostly how I've been going from the beginning is, is I, don't, I don't know in advance. I didn't know about working Jones in advance. I didn't know about Scully in advance or Colonel Korn. They just, Colonel Korn, I, I just came up with this one, like these black and white comics, and, and then the characters kind of played well. And then it was just, I don't know, his dad and Scully both kind of, you know, hmm organically moved okay. into their own. <laughs> so you'll follow the wind whichever way it goes. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. It's, well, and that's the part I enjoy. Is I, I want to be doing what I'm enjoying. Ho hopefully the people reading it are enjoying it. But if I'm not happy doing it, why am I doing it? Yeah. True. I mean, I, do, I don't have to do it. So. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's, that's all the questions I have. So thanks for coming okay. to my oh, thank you. <laughs> domicile, the comic book dojo, and checking it out. And... Yeah, giving us your thoughts. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey.